It is the stated goal of the Perimeter Institute, where we are tonight, to generate breakthroughs in our understanding of the world through research in theoretical physics. But this week, along with the University of Waterloo, the Institute is hosting the Equinox Summit, where entrepreneurs, policy experts, and academics are working to provide a breakthrough in the world's approach to and use of energy. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Pakin, and we're glad you joined us again this evening, our fourth night here in Waterloo, Ontario, at the Equinox Energy Summit. As we have been doing all week, we want to remind you that not only does this program air on television, we are live streaming it online as well. TVO.org slash the agenda is our homepage. Mike Miner is hosting a live chat right now. He's moderating that up at the top of the hall. Once again, on our homepage, TVO.org slash the agenda. You can also join us on Facebook if you want to make your voice heard. Facebook.com slash the agenda is our site there. Or send us a tweet via Twitter.com. Use the hashtags Your Agenda or Equinox Summit. And now, joining us here to help us understand the politics of energy in the 21st century, Jian Hua Ding. Her friends call her Ding Ding, and so we shall too. She's a researcher for the China Urban Construction and Development Research and Engineering Institute in Beijing, China. Jose Maria Valenzuela, visiting fellow at the Climate Policy Initiative at Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. Vagish Sharma, senior executive for energy operations and management for the Jaguri Group, that's a clean energy consultancy in New Delhi, India. Velma McCall, principal at the Ernst Cliff Strategy Group, that's a government relations firm in Ottawa. And Jason Blackstock, senior fellow for energy and the environment at CG right across the road, the Center for International Governance Innovation here in Waterloo. Great to have you five along with us this evening. First time on the program for all of you, so it's great to welcome you. We want to pose this question to start with, and I bet nobody in the hall can answer this question yet, but maybe I'm wrong. Does anybody here know anybody who doesn't have access to electricity? You know, maybe some of us do, but it's pretty unlikely because for almost all of us in Canada, electricity is like air. It is there when we need it. It would not be the case for somebody, for example, who lives in Rwanda. In fact, we're going to show you a list of countries here where most of the people don't have access to what we take for granted every day. In Rwanda, 95% of the population does not have access to electricity. In Afghanistan, it's 86%. In Kenya, it's 85%. In Cambodia, 76%. In Haiti, 62%. In Bangladesh, 59%, Nepal, 56%, even South Africa, 25% of the people who live there don't have access to electricity. And consider this little fact before we get into our discussion tonight. The amount of electricity used in one day in New York City is about equal to the electricity used in all sub-Saharan Africa minus South Africa. This is an amazing problem that we're going to talk about this evening. Now, Let's get into this. Jose Marias, get us started here. The problem of 1.4 billion people without electricity. Is this caused by the rest of us using too much? Well, it's a very interesting way of framing it. Um, we are part of the problem, but not necessarily just because we consume a lot of energy. Uh, the, there is, I believe, not a problem of how much energy is, is moving around the world. We have a lot of uh, oil moving. We have a lot of gas moving. It's an issue of these communities, these, these, these uh, um, towns, not having the ability to generate either their own energy or simply not be connected to the grid. Ding Ding, what would you say on that? Are we using too much and therefore there's not enough for everybody else? I think it's a totally different issue. Uh, they're not connected to the grid for other reasons, but it is true that if we are consuming here too much, then we're running out clean air and the climate, the carbon quota we are having. So it's a separate and a connected issue. Bagish, you're from India. How is yeah. it there? As I belong to India, in India we have 400 million people which still have no electricity connection. 400 million? Yeah, 400 million. Around 40% of India is, is still under, not electrified. How come? It's like this, uh, there is a uh, lot of less awareness programs in India. People are not aware that uh, how to go to electrify themselves and how to make themselves more understable towards this, towards this uh, technology. So this is the kind of thing like we have to make awareness program. I do agree with you just what he has said, but like I don't agree with you that uh, we consume because of this, we are not able to access to other people. 
because there is less awareness about this, so people, people need to be mobile in this sector. Okay. Jason, how would you answer the question? So part of it is we are part of the problem, but it's not just the amount of electricity we consume or the energy we consume. It's also the technologies we use to consume it and how much our fossil fuel-based electricity grid has become fossilized in technologies that were invented in the late 1800s. These are technologies that require huge infrastructure investment. You look around when you, when you walk outside, the amount of power lines that need to be built, the size of the power plants that need to be built. Those are things that require huge capital investment in, in this sort of technology to do it. And in places like Rwanda, Kenya, large parts of India, they don't have the capital to put up those sorts of capital-intensive energy infrastructure. But there are other technologies that we haven't been investing in, such as the development of distributed solar, distributed wind, battery technology, the sorts of things that can actually be deployed a lot easier and for lower costs in those sorts of environments than the, the high capital intensive infrastructure that needs to be put in. So we're part of the problem in that we're trying to stay addicted to a really dirty and bad grid system as opposed to investing in the development of clean technologies that can also help the developing world get into uh, the sort of information, electrified information world without having the same carbon emissions. We've been talking all week about how to make that tradition, uh, transition rather. Velma, I want to get you on this because Canadians, sadly, are known as some of the worst energy pigs in the world. Does that mean that because we use it and waste it too much, others don't have it? I don't, uh, as Ding Ding said, there are two separate problems. Uh, we use electricity here and we use too much, highest per capita use uh, on the, among, on the, among people on the planet. But it's a local issue in the developing world. It's about the generation and access to the generation. And you've heard, and I hope we get to talk about it tonight, some of the ideas that have come out here about microgrids and ways of bringing generation into more and more communities. And there are some great ideas that came out this week. You want to just follow um, up on that? Give, for example, Velma, what are you thinking? Well, the, it's, uh, Jason talked about it, this idea that we could have lightweight, uh, low cost, uh, but high or low efficiency uh, photovoltaic ma matched with small batteries, which means that it would be personal energy use and it doesn't need to be linear the way that it was for us. We don't need to build big plants. They can have access, personal access to electricity. And I'm not going to let us off the hook on this. Canada is the worst per capita users of energy yeah. and some of the dirtiest energy. We're the worst per capita emitters of CO2 in the world, yet we're making windfall profits. I come from Edmonton and Alberta. We make windfall profits off of uh, the oil industry every time oil hits $150 a barrel, but rather than investing that in the development of the sort of technologies that could really build sustainable businesses here around the development of solar, around the development of batteries, that we could not only be developing for our future and making ourselves market leaders in the world, we're turning it back into just developing the same old 18th century technology of well, burning oil. Let me follow this up with Fagish. Can I, uh, I mean, I think most of the developed countries in the world that have this, you know, massive infrastructure in place, it's there because governments made decisions to build it. And, you know, I presume that, you know, the developing world just either doesn't have access to that kind of capital or resources at the moment to make that happen. If that's not the case, how will it happen there on that kind of a mass scale? I think that uh, we need a kind of public-private partnership over there. There should be a public-private partnership to uh, move the grid into the ruler, in, uh, ruler department of the city or the country. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that the tariff rate, if I consider India for myself, the tariff rate in India is very high. So the po poverty, the, the people who live below the poverty line, they used to, they don't have an access to that kind of high tariff line. So I think tariff rate should also come down, then they can have an access to that. Jose Maria, what would you say on that? I would agree with everything that's been said, especially by Jason and Vargish. But um, I would like to raise the, the example of Mexico of a really bad decision taken in the 1990s. When the government decided to solve the issue of electrification of rural communities, they, they, they invested uh, massive amounts of money. They actually plugged into the, into the grid almost 90, uh, a little bit above 98% of, of the total population. But that came to a great cost. If they had uh, built this type of uh, solar panels or wind systems for specific communities that are in remote sites, they could have saved a lot of money. Hmm. And developing countries don't have uh, money to spare. Actually, Mexico certainly could have used the money in other ways, especially if they have seen 
that there were other technologies developing, and if they had invested in supporting those technologies. Sure. This is there, something that developing countries can also do. Go there, ahead, Velma. There's a, I mean, one of the things that became more apparent this, this week, and I, I want to raise a couple of things. One is we came here to talk about a 2030 time frame, which means that we brought a different kind of problem solving to this. The other thing that we're all talking about is the fact that there are legacy systems of electrification in developed countries and no, none of those legacy systems in developing countries. Legacy systems meaning? Legacy systems meaning all the, the transmission, the generation, the power lines and all that stuff. That's been here for years. That's been here for years. Okay. Um, and so we keep thinking in a very linear way that that's what has to happen in the developing world and it isn't because the new science and the new technology that's coming forward is, as I said, creating these opportunities and it wasn't for some of us until we got here and started hearing that it was possible to be off-grid and have personal power, that then we begin to problem solve in a different way about electrification for those 1.6 billion people. You know what, Ding Ding, I want to take a step back for a second because we've been tossing around, you know, on-grid, off-grid. Let's not assume for a second that everybody who's watching us right now understands what we mean by being on the grid, okay? You want to tell us what that means? Sure. Uh, on grid means a, like a household is connected to the transmission and distribution system of a bigger grid. And off grid means you have your own system that is disconnected to the grid. And they're both uh, uh, technologies to provide electricity to household. But I also want to make a point that we, while we have this good intention of bringing electricity of population, we can not just assume electricity is the only way for a happy life. Like, I had my childhood without electricity because I'm ethnic, ethnically Mongolian, and I've been working with Tibetan people who do not have uh, electricity. And after the lights is off, they go dance around the fire, and they talk to their friends. They're singing songs. It's just a happy life. And I do know a case when uh, microhydro provided off-grid electricity to a family, so that changed their lifestyle at nighttime, they start to, like, uh, there's light, there's a television, okay, and they start day, to see the... You're not saying that life without access to power is better, are you? Well... It's different, but is no, it better? No, it's, um, it's a different notion. I think we should think about electricity for what need. It's absolutely needed for education. It's absolutely needed for uh, medical purposes. But we should also, while giving electricity to local life, we should think about the social impact. That's my point. Okay. Uh, Vagish, let me try this with you. It has been said that for India to satisfy its electricity needs over the next 40 years, they are considering or may have to build 100 nuclear reactors. We are going through all kinds of Sturm und Drang here in Ontario right now to build two. And even that we can't get off the ground. You need to build 100. How is this going to happen? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a uh ministry for this, ministry for new renewable energy. And this ministry is working on this sector towards like how to provide, how to talk to the local stakeholders of that community, how to work with them. And going for 100 nuclear reactor, it's really a big job to work for that. And already there is a strike in India around uh, three, four months back regarding that how uh, the, uh, like people were not having an awareness campaign over there and there was a huge strike. Like they were saying, we do not want to go away. We don't want to go on this uh, land. We don't want nuclear power to be implemented on our agriculture land. But is this even doable to build 100 nuclear reactors in one country in one fell swoop? But as a demand, so we have to build it. There is demand and you think it will happen? Yeah, it will happen, yes, definitely. Uh, government is working on this sector, so I think that this will happen for India. Who are you going to buy them from? We will going to buy. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Not, not that I'm here to get a cut for ACL See, yeah. or anything. I'm definitely, just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a demand, and definitely we will going to make a supply also. So if, if demand is there, supply is also be there. So we will going to. We are not going to bag it from someone, but definitely we are going to put it on a decks, and we will going to sign documents with other countries, and we will going to get it. Jason, is this a good idea? That's a tough question to answer. The first, the first thing on this is, you know, my personal stance on nuclear is that we need more of it in the near term precisely because we need to avoid building the number of coal plants we're building. Right now in the world, a coal plant goes up every two days. That's part of this legacy system that Velma is talking about. And when you build a coal plant, it's not just there for this year. It's there for 40 years, 50 years. And with the damage we're already doing to the climate system, we just can't be taking that risk. Now, nuclear is not risk-free. We've seen it with Fukushima. We've seen it with other examples. But if you actually integrate across the actual lives lost due to nuclear, 
it's lower than even wind technology, than oil technology, because it, the, the, the integrated risks across society are actually fairly low. Now, that's not to say we should be building the old generation reactors that have had the problems, yeah. but there's been a lot of progress. And it, at, at the summit, we were talking about technologies that are coming uh, online in the next decade or two decades. Nuclear facilities designed to burn nuclear waste, take the waste we've produced in the past, burn it to produce new energy and produce much smaller amounts of much safer, it's not perfectly safe, nothing is, but certainly much safer, shorter lifetime nuclear technologies. Nothing's perfectly safe, but the dangers that we're taking, you know, look at the deep water horizon that happened in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Nothing is perfectly safe. There's no, a lot more deaths from fossil fuels. Jose Maria? Well, I would like to add to that point that we have to start looking into more contextual settings. So in countries like India or China that use a lot of coal, well, nuclear energy is an alternative to, to decarbonize the energy consumption uh, or the energy production. In countries, most of the countries of Latin America is not a good option because we have a lot of water. It would be, I consider, a, 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 a inadequate decision if the Brazilian government decided to increase their nuclear plants because, well, they already have a lot of water that they can use and they can keep using for, for generating power. Ding Ding, I want to put the spotlight on China for a second because one of the things I think I heard Tony Blair say once upon a time, that China is building two coal-fired generating stations, or what is it, one every two weeks. One every two weeks. We had some discussion about China on this program last night, and the guest who was sitting right in that chair uh, had this to say about that and other things related to China. Michael, if you would, roll tape. The problem right now is that China is, is outstripping us in construction. And we all know that they're really good at making knockoffs. And they can make A-grade knockoffs and B and C, and if you buy the wallet on the street, you know it's a D-grade knockoff, and the A1, you won't be able to tell the difference. The problem is they're knocking off our buildings. They're knocking off our lifestyle. And there's a lot more of them, and they're ratcheting it up big time. So they want, they want that look, that appearance, and so they build it as they build it. And it's not built as well, uh, and it's not built to the same standard, and it has the look of one of our buildings, but it's not performing like one of our buildings. Hmm. Okay, ding ding, uh, I'd like your reaction to that. Does the West have the right to tell China how it should be going about its modernization business? I don't think you need to tell us. We know how we are going. <laughs> I think uh, let's step back and think about how the ele electricity is used. We, cannot, we need to stop thinking we need electricity, we need to generate it with whatever technology, but we should look into what is the electricity being used. And currently, 74% of the Chinese electricity is used for the industries, and a lot of it is cement and steel production. And also, a lot of them is made the made in china things that exported to other countries so i think the two most unsustainable thing about china's electricity use is with its construction uh, especially when china's uh, building average life is less than 30 years they're torn down and think about the embedded carbon and energy in the building and a lot of the waste is not even recycled so we are working on that front, myself well, included. Why would it be only 30 years as the average lifespan of a building? A number of reasons. Uh, building quality, poor urban planning, and uh, change of use, change of use of land. But we're working on that front. We're trying to extend the uh, building life and uh, develop more uh, sustainable cities. There's extensive studies done on that, and we're also working on the policy front. So was uh, Terry right? Terry last night said China's basically a knockoff culture. I mean, that sounded kind of insulting the way she said it, but you sound like you're saying it's not completely untrue. Well, I think that's what happened in a few years while we're growing so fast, and that's a lesson we learned, and we're addressing that issue right now. And I also think this is not only China. Globally, we're entering into a disposable culture. Think about the things we use. Think about the way we consume. It's a disposable culture that we need to step step away from, and China is working on this. And a lot of people don't know one fact is that China's electricity, though being the largest emission source of uh, CO2, is actually taking really progressive policies of phasing out uh, the obsolete uh, capacity, closing down the inefficient plants. And th that came at great social agony and economic cost, but we had the commitment to do that. We want to overcome this and to go for a cleaner, future. We don't want to 
develop in such a fast way anymore. Vagish, would, would having a strong central government, which basically likes to make all the decisions, make that transition easier? Yeah, I do agree with you that uh, to have a government system, a, a kind of legacy should be there. And in India, but a, a kind of government system in India is like we have around 250 registered parties in India. And that matters something like if someone wants to take initiative, then others become a barrier for that. So I think that uh, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, transparency should be there to make this a program to make this uh, thing happen in some country like well, India. Here's a bit, of, uh, Jason. Let me go this uh, to you first. A bit of a controversial question. You know, getting more people on the grid around the world. We've heard estimates all week that you know we've said it today. There's a, a billion four people who really need to get onto the grid immediately. Uh, if they do that, they will live more like us, meaning they will pollute more meaning the planet is in more trouble. Is there not a downside to electrifying more of the world? So there's an underlying premise to that question, that they're going to do it the way we did. Now, we just talked about China and the mention that you know, they have been going in the same way that we have. They've been developing coal. But at the same time, China's also leading in green tech development in some ways. China just last, uh, in November, uh, brought online the first long-distance HVDC, high voltage direct current. Now, what does that mean? It's basically a very long pipeline that allow, of, of electricity that allows you to bring electricity from far distances at very low, uh, at low electricity loss. You can bring it hundreds of kilometers. Now, it's developed in China, but this is the sort of thing that could easily be exported from China to link the Sahara to Europe. And if you cover just 0.3% of the Sahara with solar panels, you can power all of Europe's electricity needs. Hmm. That's the sort of thing where China is actually ahead. Now, they're doing it differently, building, you know, trying to do some of it differently, but there's other places in the world, the 1.4 billion you're talking about could actually do it using the combination of solar and battery packs that we talked about here, the stuff that can provide basic literacy, basic medical requirements, and then there's no CO2 footprint to solar well, absorbing it into batteries. But let me ask Velma, what, I mean, yeah. how confident are you that that's the way it's going to roll out? Because we didn't roll it out that way, that's for sure. But I think, I think we're trying to solve multiple problems. They're, they're building electricity systems, trying to solve additional problems like decarbonizing and lowering the pollution and the overall footprint of the energy that they produce. So they're coming at it in a different way. They're probably going to come at it with less legacy systems, with less entrenched uh, capital stock, and with fewer problems over time. Ding Ding, you wanted to add? Yeah, I just want to add a piece of data on top of Jason's uh, point that China's electricity sector uh, achieved uh, 220 million tons of coal equivalent avoided energy saving, and that is 10% of China's uh, total energy consumption last year. Hmm. And Vagish, also, sorry, sorry, I just to wanted add? to point out mm -hmm. that if we were to start again rebuilding our system today, yeah. given what we know no, now, wouldn't we wouldn't the build the crap that we've got at the minute. <laughs> We'd do it very differently. Yeah. Yeah. Which crap would you, put to, would you <laughs> shut down first? <laughs> the crap would be the dirtiest sorts of oil, the tar sands, the coal, and you'd start moving towards it with the sort of solar technologies and wind technologies that we have available right now to produce electricity. We'd put more emphasis on getting the battery technologies online immediately so that we can level out the sort of variability you get in Jason, solar and wind. spoken like a guy who doesn't have to get a elected in Alberta. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? That's why I live in Ontario now. <laughs> Vagish, let me put this to you. Uh, chief economist for the International Energy Agency calculated that if universal electricity access throughout the world were made possible, global CO2 emissions would increase only by 0.9 percent, less than 1 percent. How is it possible that by adding more than a billion people to the grid, you could have so little impact on the CO2 emissions? Yeah, I do agree with you that uh, if people used to use some renewable sources energy in, in, their, in their daily routine, then this could be happen if, if we will go through like this. And IEA, that also includes like International Energy Agency, they have also given an indication that by 2030, there will be a decrease in the, in the crude oil by 25%. And also, if you're going to use crude oil forever, then up to 2050, it will be vanished. So I do agree with you that we have to have up coming into the renewable energy sector also. And a follow-up for you, Jose Maria. In Africa, they say cell phone use has grown from fewer than 4 million users in 1998 to more than 400 million users today. Now, these folks are recharging their phones at night, right? That's got to be a huge uptick in the use of electricity. Is that an issue? Well, it's, um, it's a great opportunity, first of all. 
because you see that these people have access to cer certain types of technologies, but they have no problem managing. If they have no problem managing a cell phone, they would have no problem managing a solar panel with a battery. Yes. Most of, in most of these cases, um, they rely on diesel, diesel generators. Generators. So right. you have, a, you have a, the, the local store that has a local that has a diesel generator with a TV, probably. So that's off the grid then. That's off the grid, but that's right. heavily polluting. Not, uh, not only polluting, but very expensive. Hmm. You have to pay not only for the cost of the diesel, but the cost of transporting the diesel, and the cost, cost of the, the person the that has monopolized the yeah. supply of electricity in a small town. So this has a great cost for the people that live in those areas. So what's the alternative? Well, solar generation, like we talked. Solar distributed generation. solar generation with the new advances on batteries. And this needs to be supported with more research from the institutions from developed and developing countries. And and I, just building off yeah. of that point, your cell phone example is the perfect one. Yeah. There's not a lot of phone lines in Africa, but lots of people have cell phones. They've skipped ahead in the technology because mm -hmm. they're not going to waste their time doing it. The, the, the solar with batteries enables that same sort of right. leapfrogging. Go, Velma. No, it. no, yeah. I mean, we, we need to start, stop talking about the grid. Yeah. It's, it's many grids. So when we talk about the solar uh, and battery pack together, we're talking about microgrids, very localized, uh, locally relevant microgrids. Yeah. You know, this example of, of the cell phone is particularly relevant not only because it expands the vision of what electricity can give to people. Mm -hmm. By using the cell phone, people is able to, to see what is the quotation of their product in the local market. So they can see how much should they get paid for their own production. Just explain that, because no one does that here. What do you, what do you say? <laughs> well, you have, uh, let's say you, you, you produce a couple of bushels or of, 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 of grain, uh, and you go to the, the person that can transport it to, to the local market, because you have no way of transporting it. If you didn't have a cell phone, he could tell you that markets are very, there's nobody buying your product, so he's going to pay almost nothing. Is this through text messages? or No, what? well, and now they can do it through text messages. I now see. there are services in which you say, you, you send a message saying what's your product, and they would reply telling you what's the, 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 the price that they are selling and buying in the local city, gotcha. in the closest city. This empowers people, and this is a great source of productivity. So the cell phone has revolutionized the way people can do business, sell crops, and so on. And Velma? microgrids can revolutionize the way people have access to energy. OK. Uh, stand by, folks. We're about halfway through, and I want to do a little business with the folks at home. We just want to remind everybody that we are uh, broadcasting live and streaming live on our website tonight, tvo.org slash the agenda. We hope you'll dial us up and participate. In that shot, you can see above our heads here the online chat that Mike Miner is moderating right now. People are weighing in through their tweets on our Facebook page, on our home page letting us know what they think about the topic we're discussing this evening. We've got a, million point, a billion four people not on the grid or in this world today that this conference is trying to think about how to get them wired. We are here at Waterloo's Perimeter Institute. We've been uh, here all week long, here tonight, one more show tomorrow night. Go to our website to learn more about the Equinox Summit and join in our li live chat. And speaking of which, I usually introduce him as hiding in some undisclosed location at 2180 Young Street, but tonight, I can see you, Mike, you're right up there. How you doing, Dan? <laughs> Mike Miner, tell us what's going on online. Okay, well, uh, it's an interesting uh, time to be online because we have so many people from the conference. A lot of the uh, young leaders of tomorrow in the forum are taking part. We have people sitting in the audience. Uh, Zoe Karen, who was on the program recently, is sitting almost directly to my left, and she tweeted that Esther, one of the Equinox Summit forum lead from Nigeria, says that she can't remember a day in her life when she was last able to keep the lights on all day. And there has been a lot of talk about technology in Africa. Uh, cell phone charging in particular sparked something. A guy going by White Kenyon uh, said that he hopes that uh, Africa can leapfrog in energy production in the same way that they managed to in communications technology to go skipping the step of uh, copper wires going landline to landline straight to cell. And really the revolution in communication technologies that sparked uh, a lot of uh, economic wealth creation in places like Rwanda and Kenya. He's hoping that these types of new technology can really uh, push Africa into the future there as well. Uh, Rex points out that a large percentage of people in Africa charge their phones from solar panels so that uh, it wouldn't actually put as much energy in the grid. Uh, and he hopes that uh, a lot of the technology that gets uh, introduced to these areas can take advantage of the same sort of things. And people are also talking about what kind of energy uh, we here in Canada need and what kind we don't need. And uh, people seem to be giving, uh, willing to give up a lot. 
Uh, a guy going by Rebel Sheeple says that uh, we don't need to shop in heated, well-lit shopping malls. Um, people are talking about uh, you know, returning to sweaters and turning off the furnace. Uh, and a lot of people are trying to get rid of the urban car dweller. And Thirsty Mind, who's a regular on these chats, uh, just thinks we should pay a, a lot more for energy, for our electricity. And uh, you know, most of the people who are chatting here online seem to be okay with that. So that's what we're hearing from the internet at this moment. Again, spoken like people who are not trolling for votes in three months' time uh, you know, <laughs> in the province of Ontario. But okay, okay, we can continue to get into this. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay. Curveball time. I tried this last night and it was a spectacular failure. And the result of it was that all of the hopes I had for technology solving these problems were reflected in the fact that I couldn't get the set to change color on cue. We've got this gorgeous set here and it's blue right now. Velma, what color would you like to see? Green. Could we do something with the set on Elizabeth May's... Hey, how about that? <laughs> Oh, okay. You know what? We asked for one color, and now you're just showing off. But that's great. That's great. I think it's appropriate you asked it to, turn, to change to green on the day of Elizabeth May and Mike Schreiner's birthday. The leader of the Greens federally and in the province of Ontario is today. So happy birthday to you two. We turn the set green for you. Thank you, Velma. Okay, let's go. Michael, nicely done. We're going to go to our next graphic after this. Here is a good news story that we want to follow up on. Costa Rica most likely to be the world's first carbon neutral country. Hmm. Costa Rica wants to be carbon neutral by the year 2021 in time for its 200th independence celebrations. And it is apparently well on the way. Three quarters of its energy comes from hydropower, growing numbers of wind farms and a new geothermal plant near Rincón de la Vieja volcano. It has also planted five million trees to replace past deforestation. Norway, New Zealand, and Iceland are also in the running. This sounds like a very good news story. And Velma, I want to know, how close are we to doing any of this? <laughs> That's a long way away for us. It is, isn't it? It is. Do we not care? It's not that we don't care. I think we've been working on, at this issue for a long time. But, you know, I mean, one of the things that was very encouraging for me about this summit is it took a 2030 time frame. The UK has had a 2050 energy strategy for the last 15 years, and we haven't managed to do that in Canada. I mean, we don't even have a, a five-year. We don't strategy. have a 2011 <laughs> energy strategy. But if we had a longer, I, I, I'm getting to your question. <laughs> it, 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 if we had a longer-term energy strategy, we would do more of that kind of, of problem solving. We'd see things in a bigger context, and we put more things on the table. That's a mix and match of things that help solve the problem. Ding, ding, this conference has a vision for energy, for electrifying the world in a carbon-neutral way to the year 2030. Do most countries around the world, do any countries around the world have plans as, I mean, I guess that's a fairly soon timetable as these things go, right? 2050 is a long way. 2030 is not that far away. Do countries do this? Oh, I don't know about other countries, but China have this five-year plan system, and we always uh, uh, set targets for the next five years so, and define where we want to go, and uh, that is a very effective way. Actually, the carbon emission I just mentioned is because of the 11th five-year plan, and we took all these uh, measures both from the supply side and then from the demand side, and we effectively re reduce the rate of increase uh, in energy consumption. Hmm. Like uh, in India also, we have launched National Action Plan on Climate Change, under which we cover national solar mission, national biodiesel mission, and national mission on sustainable agriculture. So uh, we are going to cover more than 30,000 megawatt by 2025. So this is an enormous number which I am going to talk about to you. But like we do have, India is also working on these plans. You have a plan to 2025. Yeah. Which sounds more realistic than having a plan to 2050. I mean, 2050, most of us aren't going to be, well, I shouldn't say most of us. Some of us are not going to be alive then, right? Yeah. But, uh, we have planned for 2025. So, so uh, in our country, like uh, they have enormous opportunities and enormous uh, availability towards the sources, but we are still going to work on this program, so people are working on this program. Jason, is it easier for, for the countries that don't have, what did you call it, legacy infrastructure? Legacy infrastructure. Easier yeah. for those countries who don't have that to do this? It's 
It certainly is easier. If you're starting with a blank slate, it's always easier to design a better system given what we know now. But it's not just the legacy infrastructure that matters. It's also whether or not you're beginning with the end in mind. I mean, I sound like I'm quoting a self-help book, and I actually am on that one. But beginning with the end in mind really matters. When you take a vision of the future, I mean, I'd, I'd push back a little, and yes, 2050 is in the future, yeah. but 2100, you know, we need visions that go further out and plans that work backwards from that. Be, you know, we need to envision the future that we really want to live in here so we can begin phasing out that, that legacy system, as opposed to making decision from election cycle to election cycle or uh, quarterly statement to quarterly statement. If, that, if that's what we're driven by, we're not going to move towards the opportunities. Places like Korea, for example, they have a pretty big uh, legacy system to deal with as well. They're, they're a, a pretty developed country, yeah. but during the, uh, during the economic recovery, they invested 80% of their economic recovery money into green jobs, green investment, green growth, because they they want to be the future leaders of owning that technology. Do We've got the money here, and we could have been doing that too. We don't know that that will actually pay off, though, do we? Yes, we do. We know, I, it, I, we, we know it might make the world greener. We don't necessarily know if it'll make them richer. It, because there are so um, many energy markets that are still expanding, if you look at the rate at which the electricity sector and energy sectors got to grow, the, the UN just released new report, uh, a new report a couple weeks ago. Originally, we thought we'd peak at 9 billion people by 2050. It's now going to be projected to be 10 billion by 2100. So basically, this century, we better get used to rapid growth. The more people there are, the more energy there's going to be needed. And there's always going to be new market opportunities. And Korea is going to capitalize on a whole huge amount of that as, as new energy markets come online. So I think it's a great investment. And we're just behind. And we're, we're losing out in the future. Thelma. And we also have to understand that we're making decisions today and building capital stock that's going to be around for 30 or yeah. 40 years. So you say 2050 is a long time a day, a long time away, but we are making decisions today that affect that and we could be making different decisions if we were thinking about it on that kind of time scale. I hear you, but apropos of her birthday, when I hear Elizabeth May talk about we need to do things not towards 2050, but today. We need to make things happen today or we're going to lose the planet, it just makes me feel we're not approaching this urgently enough. It makes me wonder whether we're not approaching it urgently enough. Well, I mean, the urgency has to happen and un be understood in the context of what it is that we're building. If we're going to build the infrastructure, that kind of infrastructure, we have to understand that we're asking people to make long-run investments, and they have to understand what they're making long-run investments in to maintain the status quo or to do something that will be relevant in 2030 or 2050. I mean, this is, this is the beauty of what's been created here, is that by giving us a longer-term time, table, then both the quorum members, the scientists and the forum members could sit down and start to talk about how, uh, how to think about it differently and how to build different sets of solutions that will, can be worked on today, technology developed today, and that can uh, be relevant down the road. I love this tweet we just got. This is very Gretzkyan. Yes. Very nice. yes. For anybody who knows what Wayne Gretzky always said, he always used to say, don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going to be. And we just saw a tweet that suggests the Koreans are going to where the future is. Another quick point I'd just like to make is that uh, we have to, we in Canada need to understand that the world is changing around us on this. Technologies are being developed and people are understanding that the developing world electrification is an access to a market. And more and more I'm seeing trade agreements being developed between the U.S. and China or the U.S. and Korea that build in clean technologies, that build in these kinds of things. And we in Canada are being bypassed by this because we're not thinking what those energy needs will be. Okay, let me put a new issue on the table here, and I want to talk about two different groups of 1.4 billion people. This is a number that seems to be recurring this week a lot. One group of 1.4 billion people has no access to electricity. Another group of 1.4 billion people are in the richest countries in the world, and they use 80% of the world's electricity. Some people, as we discussed off the top of the program, think that this second group of very rich people ought to use less power to make it easier for those who don't have it. Some people think science can resolve this, technology, innovation, and therefore we don't have to tell these 1.4 million rich energy hogs how to use their power, which is the way to go. Jose Maria, you want to get us started? Well, that's a hard question, but um, I would first of all make sure not to divide only these by countries. I'm glad you most of the times talked about people, um, mm -hmm. because even in developed countries, there's people with energy poverty. Uh, there's a big gap between the consumption of 
of, of uh, uh, habitant of Hong Kong, for example, uh, and an habitant of Inner Mongolia in China, and there's a big gap between the, 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 the citizen of Mexico City and the citizen in the jungles in the south, as it is in the United States and Canada and most of Europe. So we have to, first of all... Yeah, think beyond country. Yeah, think beyond country, mm -hmm. think beyond these traditional borders. And I do believe that the 1.5 billion people that consume the most energy do have a burden to take. Uh, not, not only in terms of changing their life, some will, some won't. I believe that uh, we have a lot of other opportunities to improve life with more energy efficiency. Um, all these smartphones are a great example of that. Mm -hmm. we, how, how many electronics did we, do we stop using just by using a very efficient smartphone? But, uh, well, this, this, they will have to take a burden. Let me ask Ding Ying this. Do you think the 1.4 billion people who are connected in many different countries have the right to tell, for example, tens or hundreds of millions of people in China who are not connected to a grid, sorry, we can't electrify you because you're doing it through coal fire generation and you're polluting the planet too much. Well, according to my philosophy, I'm not going to say what other people should do. So that question I would not answer. But <laughs> also, on the other <laughs> front, I think... That's the most I elegant think... dodge I've had. <laughs> 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 Nicely done. Nicely played. Yes. On the other side, I think... Uh, these people who are consuming too much energy, including some p rich people in China, I think uh, there's got to be a stop at some point, not only because you're making energy available for other people, but because this planet is just going into disasters, and if you, don't, it's, you stop for your own good. Jason, can we tell the Chinese, sorry, we don't agree with your plans to modernize because you're doing it through coal and that's just going to pollute more. That's definitely not the way to approach the political situation. First off, you can't be the hypocrite that's the worst polluter per capita in the world and tell anybody else what to do. But you know, at this conference, for example, it's, it, again, I, I agree very much with Ding Ding. It's not about shooting all over other people. That's a pretty bad way to approach the problem. It begins with saying, we will. We are going to lead by example. And you know, that's what, again, skating to where the puck is going to be. Get out in front and demonstrate the opportunities. And in Canada, we have a lot of resources. So to, to throw a little bit of praise back on my own province, you know, despite the fact that Alberta is developing the tar sands, they have also invested a tremendous amount uh, of money through the Alberta uh, Innovation Fund into the development of, for example, the National Institute for Nanotech, developing where, where Jillian Buryak, who was here with us during the week, and other leading nanotech experts are developing new solar technologies, are developing the beginning foundations, the science, the tech, to be able to make these changes. We just need to be doing more of that, and we need to be out in front looking for the opportunities to help China, to help the, the places that are just beginning to electrify to have better technologies. Do it by example. Don't do it by shooting all over. I do agree with you. Like, I do agree with Jose Mario also that instead of saying developing and developed nations related to the climate change. Climate change and global warming, this is a global issue. So we should not consider developing and developed. This is a, our issue. We, we, are, we should face okay. this issue. And like, for example, terrorism, it's a global issue. We never say that there is a, a bomb blast in a developing country. There was a bomb blast in a developed country. We used to say there was a bomb blast in Pakistan, there was a bomb blast in India, there was a bomb blast in the US. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to understand that it's our uh, problem. We have to tackle it. So, like this only. I want to just confirm something Jason just said because uh, this is a family program and some of you may have misinterpreted. <laughs> you were saying shoulding. Shoulding. S H O U L D I N G. Yes. <laughs> Not. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to get clarification on that. That's good. Okay. What, um, Velma, on the same question, what's the way to go here? The, the 1.4 billion who've got it, you know, some of them want to deny being hooked up to the grid to those who don't have it because the way they want to do it will pollute the planet more. I, that's, a, that's the wrong way to think about it, and I think you're oversimplifying a very complex... Moi? <laughs> a, a very complex international dynamic. Um, I think, you know, it's not, not top-down. It's not top-down. Yeah. And I mean, this is part of the, the shift that's happening in the international climate change negotiations as well. It's, it can't be dictated at a top-down level. Either from, you know, no party can dictate to the other. It's got to be first uh, bottom-up building, answering, answering local solutions, local, regional, country solutions about what they want okay. in their electricity systems. Despite your admonition, I'm going to continue with a top-down question. Jose Maria, to you first Go. on this. 
The conflict we have been talking about comes up at the United Nations all the time, the very definition of top-down. We've had lots of climate change conferences. We've had Kyoto, we've had Copenhagen, we've had Cancun. These are very impressive. Lots of people go, lots of reporters cover them. There's lots of resolutions that come out of them. Do they make any progress? Well, first of all, right now, they are, this, they are having one of these meetings back in Bonn, in, in Germany. Uh, every year at the middle, at, uh, at this time of the year, they have a meeting in Bonn where they prepare the, the meeting at the end of the year. And I think that they, they are delivering results. This has to be, this diplomatic process is a very slow process uh, that can only be fueled by these uh, actions coming from within the countries. Um, this is not the first time that we see a very long diplomatic process. We have the law of the sea, for example. The law of the sea took more than 30 years to be approved by all the countries. And actually took a couple of other cases to be approved by, or ratified by the, the rest of the countries. So we, we don't have to close our minds to the diplomatic uh, setting. Um, and actually, even in the diplomatic se setting, these conflicts that appear to be very obvious in media are not so in, in reality. This division between developed and developing countries is not so. You, you would see some coalitions between developed and many developing countries. You'll see some states that had been called uh, bridge states like Korea, like Mexico, mm -hmm. like Costa Rica, that are actually building blocks in between um, developed okay. and developing countries. I want to hear what Velma's got to say about the uh, advisability and effectiveness of these get-togethers. <laughs> That's what I thought. I think they're necessary. <laughs> no, honestly, necessary, I, I, th I, think, I think they're necessary. I think, uh, obviously, you pointed to uh, Kyoto came out, and we've, we, we in Canada, I can't speak for other countries, but we in Canada then spent a uh, dozen years having a fight about whether we thought Kyoto was the right way to go or not, and not focusing on what it was that we should be doing internally. Copenhagen came along, and it was a it was a big blow up. But I think that Cancun set a different kind of framing and started the conversation in a different direction. But Cancun could not have happened without Copenhagen, and Copenhagen uh, also allowed people to say uh, maybe we all have some responsibility in this. And I don't just mean countries. I mean I think that citizens saw that it it blew up in Copenhagen. Uh, it you know, some, there was something underlying there, but it blew up, and then people are going to have to take some personal responsibility for what it is that they're doing. And it is going to take some time to put this together, but we, it is a global problem. If we can understand after the 2008 economic shock that we need a financial ecosystem and that we have shared financial goals that keep us all safe, why can't we understand that we have a global ecosystem and that we can all work together in those ways? Great question. What's the answer? Well, why can't we? I, th I, think that w I think that we can. We just have to start thinking about this differently. Okay. Ding, ding. Well, I think top-down approach uh, without, with the absence of uh, effective international jurisdiction, it's useful, but it's far from enough. And mm -hmm. it has apparently experienced the difficulties in its implementation. But the top-down approach in China apparently worked uh, okay in terms of phasing out uh, the backward capacity and then closing down the inefficient plants. But still, in China, even when we have effective government control, top-down approach is not enough. We are now also starting from the bottom-up approach, like uh, personally I'm involved in a low-carbon community development project, uh, to think the community as a cell, if it's a healthy, cell of the society, the, the whole society, if it's composed by healthy cells, it's going to be a healthy society. Jason. I think we've done ourselves, it, the way in which the climate problem has been framed as being a global problem is exactly right. Everyone on the planet is going to be affected and impacted. But I think we've also done ourselves a bit of a disservice in the last decade and a half by focusing so much on the global dimensions of it and the fact that we need some global deal to solve it. People got used to the idea that it's something leaders do at a summit table mm -hmm. as opposed to something we do every day. Our climate problem is really the symptom. It's the fever that is the result of the sickness or the, 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 the taking in of the, the dirty coal, the dirty oil, the burning of fossil fuels. That's the actual but, cause. So it's, right. it's the energy system that we have that we're responsible for. As individuals, we can make different choices. Okay, but use Velma's example. If the whole, I, mean, I shouldn't say the whole world, but if the, if the 20 most powerful countries in the world 
economically speaking, could get together and say, this is the approach we need to take collectively to tackle the economic crisis, why can't they do it when it comes to the environment? Perfect example. Again, it, it, those 20 country, out of those 20 countries, a very large number of them are democratic. And when the economic crisis hit, every single person in this room, I'm guessing, every single person in these, these developed de democracies sat there and go, you fix this problem, politician, or I'm kicking your butt out next election. Hmm. They haven't stepped yeah. up and said that in the democracies mm. about yeah. climate yet. They haven't said that about the energy system. And mm -hmm. again, this is where we need to reframe it as the personal responsibility. We have the personal responsibility when you go to the ballot box. We have the personal responsibility when we go to buy a car. We have the personal mm -hmm. responsibility in the choices of how we use energy what we demand of our energy systems. We've lost something in making it a global framing that everyone else is, that, that, that the leaders are responsible and it's not us. Fagish? I think that uh, rather these programs are, they have the advantages also. It becomes some, some kind of thing which is a awareness program to the people. If in India we, we talk, we, people talk that what is, uh, like if people do not know about the global warming, climate change, but yes, they know about Kyoto Protocol, they know about uh, can consume it. They know about COP 16. They know about uh -huh. the COP 17. But this is a kind of awareness we create in, a, in, in, in people, a kind of advertisement, you can say. But Velma, how useful are these? I know you say they move the yardsticks forward and they have to happen, even if they're, you know, even, this is an exaggeration, but even if they break their heart, our hearts from time to time, these things still have to happen. What is the value in countries, and Canada was one, signing these protocols and then spending the next 10 years basically ignoring them or figuring out how not to do them? I've thought about this a lot, and I think for a long time we thought that the, the psychology of solving climate change was to set a target, set a challenge yeah. for ourselves, and then by setting a long-term challenge we would just work in its direction and we would be making progress. But it was detached from very practical decisions. And so I think the forward challenge target, we still have to set those challenge targets, but they have to be tied back to very practical, specific things that we can do at a local level. And just to give, throw a, a, a compliment to Jose Maria's Mexico, I mean, one of the reasons why Cancun worked was because Mexico is internally aligned. Their municipalities, their political system. Yeah. I mean, they yes, there are still, it's a very complex issue, very difficult to... to uh, basically same page? But they're on basically the same page. We don't have that anywhere else in North America. We right. don't have an internal alignment that's focused around problems. And part solving. of that is it's not just about setting a target that's a number, 17% below 1990 or yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That's not a vision that anybody buys into. You need to paint a picture. If you're going to set a goal for the future, set a goal that's in terms of the way we're going to live our lives, the way we're going to interact with each other, the way our mm -hmm. kids are going to live and interact with each other. Ding, ding, that's you, visceral. You just went like this a moment ago. You went like, what did that mean? Bottom-up approach. Bottom-up. And yeah. th so concretely, that means what? Well, I think, uh, well, I love those superhero movies like uh, you just uh, are the most powerful person in the world and you work uh, on the problem, you kill the villain, you work, walk away with the most attractive uh, lady, everyone's jealous, but <laughs> I think there's no single technology, there's no right. single policy that can solve this problem, there's no superhero technology or policy that can address this global complicated problem by itself, and that is why we need collective action, and the, ultimately the answer is bottom up, it lies with you. And I think our friend from China is going to get the last word here for a couple reasons. Number one, because that was excellent. Number two, because she says I'm out of time. So <laughs> that'll do it for us tonight. Thank you very much, guests, for coming and appearing on the program. We wish you well in your final deliberations as you come up with a blueprint, an Equinox communique that we'll talk about on tomorrow night's program. We thank the audience for taking time out of their schedules to come and join us tonight here at the Perimeter Institute as well.